Uh, so welcome everyone to this virtual book launch event of Norris Dale's new book, Hybrid Political Order and the Governance of Uncertainty, published by Rutledge. My name is uh, Stefan Engelkamp. I'm a lecturer in international relations education at the Department of War Studies, and I'm currently convening the Research Center in International Relations with my colleague, Kieran Paul, who is also um, moderating this event with me. And we are really delighted to welcome all of you on this occasion and a particular warm welcome to our three panelists, Nora Steele, Claudia Arado, and Craig Larkin. Um, before I introduce our panelists and the format of today's event, let me um, remind you um, to keep your microphones off while a presenter is speaking and please put your questions or comments in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or if you have a question, um, um, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, just unmute yourself or like um, use the, the virtual high, um, hand function. Um, we have uh, now, without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. Nora Steele, uh, who is an assistant professor in international relations at Radboud University. And Nora's research focuses on the analysis of governance and politics in conflict effect affected settings. She specializes in political authority in conflict situations, where Nora um, studies the organization of services, security, and representation by hybrid governance arrangements during and after violent conflict. She also analyzes the governance of forced displacement, in particular the governmentalities and bordering practices that emerge through the politics and policies directed at refugee communities in so-called regional host countries such as Lebanon. Um, Nora engages with these themes through qualitative fieldwork and mostly in the Middle East and critical policy analysis. And then we are delighted that two of our colleagues from the Department of War Studies are with us to discuss Nora's book, um, Claudia Arado and Craig Larkin. Um, so Claudia is a professor in international politics at War Studies, and she's currently principal investigator of an EU-funded research project on security flaws. Uh, Claudia's research explores the implications of global security practices. She looks into how problems and people become objects and subjects of security and what this does to democratic politics. And her current research focuses on how digital technologies um, reconfigure, um, reconfigure um, um, security and surveillance practices, um, as well as the relations between security, democracy, and critique. And then finally, uh, we have uh, our second discussant, Dr. Craig Larkin. And um, we are really happy to have him here. You he just came back from Lebanon. Uh, Craig is a senior lecturer in comparative politics of the Middle East, and he's director of the Center for the Study of Divided Societies at King's College London. Uh, Craig holds a PhD in Middle East studies, and he studied Arabic at Damascus University and has worked um, in community development projects in Lebanon, Jordan, and in Iraq. And Craig's research focuses on memory and conflict in the Middle East, the relationship between war, faith, and politics. And he has written extensively on urban geopolitics, Islamist uh, movements, and post-conflict politics. And his current book project uh, is examining the Islamic movement inside Israel. And now, without further ado, I'm very much looking forward to Nora's presentation. Nora. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks so much for, for these introductions and for, for the invite, of course. Um, a bit of a disclaimer, I, I, it's definitely in some ways about international relations, what I'm going to tell you, but um, the empirics are mostly related to local and, and national uh, skills of governance, so bear with me there. I, I do hope we can get to talk a bit more on, on these international uh, dynamics of, of sort of the hybridity and the politics of uncertainty that I'll describe. Um, so maybe you can uh, bring in some some new food for thought for me there as well. Um, let me see. 
Yes. So the book, yeah, it's it's it was released last year, um, and uh, there's a, a paperback uh, out uh, just now. It's here, which is very exciting because it means it's finally sort of affordable. Um, however, and I'm not allowed to say this, if there are people um, uh, who won't be able to afford the book, I'm happy to share a PDF, of course. Um, so much for the PR. But but what my book was about, why I was um, keening on writing it, is is um, is the attempt to rethink the political dimensions of, of, of chaos, of unpredictability, of uncertainty um, that we often uh, find, um, especially in my field of studies. My background is in conflict studies, and, and there we really look at sort of situations where different crises and, 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 and uh, uh, violent crises come together. And in my case, or the case is central to this, this book uh, that I'm talking about today, it, that's the unprecedented displacement of, uh, of people uh, produced by war. Um, on the one hand, and state fragility, which is a, a horrible term, but I'll, I'll use it as a shorthand. And nonetheless, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, on the other hand, so more concretely, um, the presence and the governance of Palestinian and Syrian refugee communities in Lebanon. And what, what struck me in doing research on, on this, um, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about how that research looked in, this, in a second, is that um, that situation was often presented as being chaotic in the sense of lacking policy frameworks, incomplete implementation, fragmented coordination, and that this resulted in confusion on mandates, on responsibilities, on that it uh, resulted in unpredictability of rules and regulations and uncertainty about prospects and projects. But what, what struck me is that this is hardly ever questioned, right? This was, this was not surprising. We take it actually for granted. There was often this undertone of, well, what can we expect, right? When an enormous number of people seeks refuge in a country that is already infamous for its deadlock, for its paralysis, for its conflict, for its institutional fragility, right? Right. But at the same time, I, I increasingly felt that that's not the whole story. So I started looking at institutional ambiguity, and I'll define that a bit more precisely later, um, in refugee crisis situations as um, being perhaps mostly, but not only the result of lacking host country capacity, which was sort of the default explanation for all these things. Rather, it also follows from a lack of political will to make coherent decisions and policies about refugee governance, which is often captured uh, by dynamics of non-policy or ambiguous policy. So that's what I, in this book, try to empirically explore and then conceptualize. Um, let me how do the absence and the ambiguity of policies to address refugee presences emerge? How are they, rep they reproduced? And what interest do they serve? And I explore that through two case studies, um, which, which were basically two different projects. My PhD research, which was based on 12 months of ethnographic fieldwork in, in two Palestinian informal refugee communities in South Lebanon. And then later uh, a postdoc project, uh, which, um, uh, revolved around long distance fieldwork and expert interviews on Syrian informal settlements in the Bakar Valley and, and, and the national policy dynamics on um, Lebanon's response to the Syrian refugee crises. Um, and what I try to do based on these empirical uh, uh, studies is, is bring together various literatures on critical refugee studies, critical policy studies and ignorance studies to make sense of these dynamics. From that, and um, um, you will notice that in this presentation, there's a lot of disclaimers because it's 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 pretty challenging to, to sort of summarize a book project in uh, 10, 15 minutes. But from that, my main argument emerged that, that the, the absence of coherent policy, which I've conceptualized as institutional ambiguity, on how to deal with refugees stems from a particular political system, but is also kept in place to serve political interests, it works to maximize discretionary power of Lebanese authorities and to undermine the mobilization of refugee communities, which I've called, uh, uh, I've, I've termed the politics or a politics of uncertainty. So I really want to show that this, this chaos, this uncertainty, this insecurity is both contingent on displacement and host country fragility, but also strategically reproduced. So, okay, let's zoom in a bit because it, I've often heard in presenting this that, that, that this um, seems very counterintuitive, right? Why would you want to do this? Um, why would there be some sort of masterminded chaos? 
Well, the literature gives us two generic reasons, uh, two uh, different sets of reasons. Generically, of course, policy is always ambiguous because it's reactive. It's always trailing behind fast changing realities um, because it's always a compromise. So there has to be room for flexibility and maneuverability. That's what diplomacy is all about, right? So that's also not necessarily negative. That can be very important and productive and constructive. And there's a more specific set uh, of reasons of why um, uh, uh, uncertainty might be strategically reproduced, which is that ambiguous policy can serve stated and uncertain stated objectives and interests of authorities in dealing with unwanted refugee populations. And that's really what I, what I focus on most in the book, which is about Lebanon specifically. It hopes to go beyond Lebanon a bit, but it, its base is rooted in Lebanon, um, where, it, under, where it's, it explores as I said before, the, the, the interconnection of, 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 on the one hand, the presence of uh, uh, um, a large number of refugees, the highest number of refugees um, per capita in the world in Lebanon, um, approximately 1.5 million Syrian refugees uh, that flat uh, the Syrian war since 2011, and then some 250,000 Palestinian refugees that have been there much longer since uh, the 1948 Nakba. Um, and these refugee presences uh, need to be understood in the context of Lebanon's sort of complex hybrid sectarian political system, which bears a lecture on its own, of course. Um, but what's important to, to, to sort of stress is that the, the, the system of colonial imposed sectarianism and the demographic sensitivity that, that has institutionalized in addition to its legacy of violent uh, conflict has resulted in, in sort of a, an oligopolist kleptocracy where, where uh, um, a lot of um, sectarian parties have, well, basically in many ways and forms captured the state. Again, something that's addressed a bit with a bit more nuance in the book, but let's, um, let's keep it at this, um, in this presentation. So I've tried to understand how when these things come together, how we should best understand refugee governance. Um, and one of the points of departure was that after doing my fieldwork, one of the common conclusions I often got on refugee regulation, on refugee governance was, it's a mess. We really don't understand. That came from refugee communities, from activists, from policymakers, from international humanitarians, from many different angles. And as I said, um, so the the the, the citations that you're reading now uh, sort of testify to that. And as said, in a way it's logical, but for me, the interesting thing was that refugees and other interlocutors also understood this not as just a contingency of host state capacity or large scale displacement, but as a, as a disciplinary strategy of host country authorities. And this is this, this first citation that you're reading here um, really got me thinking and, and, and is something that I explored more systematically than throughout the book, to what extent that's actually the case. What is not just contingent on capacity, but strategically um, pursued or reproduced. And I realize, um, so this is this, this thesis that I'll present in a bit more schematically in the next slide is based on case studies uh, uh, um, with Palestinian and Syrian refugees. And of course the dynamics between these communities, the historicity, the context is very different. And also the dynamics of what I've called institutional ambiguity or the politics of uncertainty, they play out different for both groups. But one of the, 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 the um, um, conclusions of the book or, or the suggestion that the book makes is that actually there's also a lot of often unrecognized parallels between the ways in which Lebanon has dealt with these two different refugee communities. And that the, the constant reproduction of uncertainty is actually one of those parallels. Um, in, in the remainder of this presentation, I'll focus mostly on examples uh, uh, from the Syrian refugee crisis um, because I had to make choices, but, but I'm hopeful, hopeful we can talk about um, the parallels a bit more later on as well. So what I contend in the book is that Lebanon's governance of refugees is determined by informality, liminality, and exceptionality. Um, I'm gonna just throw some quick uh, uh, definitions at you here rather than all the complex problematizations that I offer in the book. But with informality, I basically mean anything done without the formal regulation of state authorities which doesn't mean that state authorities don't regulate refugee presences, but that they don't do so through formal laws and policies, right? 
So the second component, liminality, sort of uh, uh, gets at the, the, the temporal uncertainty that, that refugees face and the constantly reproduced temporariness and conditionality of any form of regulation of refugee presences, which is focused on the short term, on the ad hoc measures. And then thirdly, the exceptionality, which is obviously a term very familiar with anyone in, in sort of migration and refugee studies, um, that any decisions or any agreements or any regulations are uh, beyond the law and beyond um, the normal. So I looked at these dynamics, informality, liminality, and exceptionality, um, specifically in three domains of refugee governance. At status, so basically questions of to what extent are refugees recognized as refugees, to what extent do they have formal residency status, and second, shelter. So this really uh, revolves more about questions of encampment, how are refugees hosted, sheltered? Um, and thirdly, representation, getting at the basic question of who speaks for refugee communities, who represents them, both locally and internationally. So all these, these three domains, status, shelter, and representation are characterized by informality, liminality, and exceptionality, um, which creates a situation of institutional ambiguity. Rules and regulations and mandates are unclear. What is allowed, what is, who is responsible, what refugees are supposed to do is often very hard, if not impossible to determine, not only by refugees, but also by the people whose profession it is to figure these things out. And that follows, as I've said before, from, from that just doesn't just emerge, but it follows from particular form, uh, forms of policy inaction on the one hand, a policy ambivalence on the other hand. So not making policy, or making vaguely formulated and partially or arbitrarily implemented policies. And as I said before, usually this is taken at face value, right? The enormity and the unpredictability of a refugee crisis and then the fragility of a whole state, of course, there's gonna be a lack of capacity to make coherent constrictive policy. And, and I really wanna stress that, that I don't dispute this at all in the book, but I argued that this reading, this focus on capacity um, does obscure important things. And institutional ambiguity is continued, but it's also the result of strategic political considerations, a lack of political will to make a here and constructive policy. So I'm, I'm gonna throw in an example from, from a Syrian case study to, to show you a bit more of how that works, what that means. Um, Overall, although of course in the last decade there have been important shifts, but overall Lebanon has governed the presence of Syrian refugees through what government officials have actually called a set of notes. Um, no refugees, no camps, and no representation. So there's been a, a tendency in policy to not recognize uh, the refugee status of displaced Syrians, to uh, um, um, not grant them residency status, and to not count official numbers of Syrian refugees. They're not registered to some extent. I'll, I'll, again, this is a bit more complicated, but let's, um, let's delve into the, the nuances later. Um, similarly, there has been a no camp policy. That doesn't mean there are no camps, no Syrian refugee camps in, in Lebanon, but that mostly uh, Syrian refugees have been forced uh, to self-settle as it's called in humanitarian terms. And that the, the, the refugee camps that are there are informal. Um, and not uh, regulated by either the state or UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. And then thirdly, there has been a sort of policy of no representation. The idea that there should be no um, uh, formal representatives, no committees, um, no spokespersons for Syrian refugees. And I've construed this in the book as a choice for sort of denial and abandonment. And I say choice, and that's contentious, because I want to highlight um, um, that these decisions to uh, govern the Syrian refugee crisis through this idea of a set of no's has been to some extent deliberate. Um, when it comes to the no refugees perspective, there's a liberal choice not to sign a refugee convention. There's a deliberate choice not to accept, uh, to, to accept large scale illegality of refugees. Um, and there's a deliberate choice not to register refugees this is not just related to capacity, but also uh, to political will as um, the Lebanese state has pre prohibited UNHCR um, to further register refugees. When it comes to, to shelter, to the domain of shelter, we've seen a similar informality, liminality and, and exceptionalism in the no camp policy. 
and and I definitely uh, would not want to promote sort of the old fashioned large scale refugee camp policy as a solution to displacement. But I want to make the point here that, that the, the choice of, of Lebanese authorities to not um, organize or allow for the organization of refugee camps is not just a capacity issue, um, but also a choice. And thirdly, when it comes to uh, no representation here, I want to highlight or the book highlights in detail how this is a deliberate choice to undermine grassroots organizations, for instance, uh, uh, the, the forming of committees by CSOs and, and NGOs um, in refugee uh, uh, settlements, and rather to create a system of interaction between imposed uh, 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 camp commanders and security agencies. So here too, it's not just a capacity not to uh, want to have representation on behalf of refugees, but a preference for an informalized, securitized form of representation, which I should really put between quotation marks. So as a result of this informality, liminality, and exceptionalism in, in the realms of, of uh, status, shelter, and representation, we see a very partial, piecemeal, inconsistent framework of engagement with refugee presences in the country, um, which, which makes every decision informal and temporary. Um, the lack of refugee status and residency status results in, in huge protection gaps and allows for uh, extreme exploitation of refugees. The absence of camps is, is one of the reasons why uh, um, there has been so much economic marginalization. Basically, refugees have been forced to pay for their own settlement and have often been extorted uh, by landlords uh, um, on whom they are dependent. And the lack of formal representation and the undermining of representative grassroots structures by Lebanese authorities means that there's no collective organization to demand a change to this misery. So the overall consequences, as many others have also recognized, of course, are legal precarity, economic vulnerability, and political marginalization, basically complete dependency on the goodwill of Lebanese authorities um, in many ways and forms, which makes human rights abuses and poverty endemic. So this is not new, but what my book tries to do is give us a new perspective on how that situation has been able to emerge and, and endure. And to understand that, it's really important to, to understand why this informality, liminality, and exceptionalism would be beneficial. And here we can look at two sort of uh, levels of analysis, I would say. First, not having clear decisions, mandates, and procedures allows authorities to avoid responsibility, accountability, and liability. To have deniability, because there are no formal rules or, or regulations, is in that sense very convenient. And that's a universal thing, right? It's not just Lebanon, it's not just refugees. Um, we see the exact same thing uh, happening in our, in our own polities and countries. A second level of analysis, and this is often uh, what's found a bit more pro provocative about my argument, is that the consequences of this institutional ambiguity in terms of status, shelter, and representation um, serve political authorities' stated and unstated goals and interests. It helps allow Lebanese authorities to control, exploit, and expel refugee communities. It helps them to control refugee communities because, well, we need to take a step back there, and this is also where the Palestinian case study comes in, politically and military mo militarily mobilized refugee communities are basically Lebanon's worst nightmare due to its sectarian uh, sensitivities, due to its sort of trauma of uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization's military presence in the country. And creating existential uncertainty and precarity undermines the material, the social, the cognitive ability of refugees and those that seek to help them to collectively mobilize. It fragments them and undercuts them legally, spatially and politically. Because basically all energy of these refugee communities goes to surviving, to figuring out where they need to go, how they need to um, and behave in, rather than to strategize or to collectively organize. And this is clearly not sort of absolute. And I, I'd love to go into sort of also the, the, um, um, uh, the instances where refugees have actually appropriated uh, uh, informality or uncertainty to work for them. But this would be my overarching perspective here. This existential uncertainty has also allowed uh, um, uh, authorities to exploit um, refugee communities. Due to a lack of status, lack of shelter, and lack of representation, refugees, as I said, are really dependent on, on local authorities, mayors, muhtars, 
um, on security agencies who actually do most of the governing of refugees on a local level. Um, Lebanese landlords, Lebanese uh, 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 sponsors, cafes, um, which have resulted in, in exploitation and abuse that are systematic. And that is not just sort of beneficial for, for the very, for the different um, Lebanese that are benefiting from what has been called refugee economies on a local level, um, but it's also in the interest of national political elites through sort of the, 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 the complex patronage networks uh, that operate in Lebanon where um, the people that make money out of refugees locally are sort of protected and enabled by, by national politicians who rely on them to protect their local electoral interests. And thirdly, and I think this becomes ever more relevant and important, um, it also, this, this politics of uncertainty that results in institutional ambiguity also allows Lebanon's authorities um, to expel refugees. So Lebanon's official policy is to encourage return of Syrian refugees by all possible means. And pressure to return is really increasing tremendously, but it was always really the priority or the only thing that Lebanese um, usually uh, uh, um, uh, disagreeing um, governing elites actually agreed on. And existential uncertainty and the marginalization of this uncertainty um, are clear push factors for return of refugees, sometimes directly because uh, of the evictions that informal housing uh, um, made abundant, but also sometimes indirectly. I've, I've had interviews with refugees, Syrian refugees said that really we prefer the evil we know in Syria than the, the, the sort of more elusive uh, repression that we face in Lebanon. So, to wrap up, my book has mostly tried to, to, to show um, through various case studies and vignettes is that the plight of refugees in Lebanon is not just outright repression, right? But often it's also materializes through strategic inaction or vagueness that allows for disciplining of refugee population because it creates vulnerability, it creates uncertainty, and this undermines the ability of refugee communities to resist, to contest that vulnerability through collective action. And this is not sort of masterminded chaos, right? It's partly built into the Lebanese system and it's reproduced because it serves direct um, and indirect interest. It helps Lebanese authorities to avoid accountability and it helps them to control, exploit, and expel refugee communities. And I've, I've, I've thought long and hard on how to call this, right? Many people will ask me that, is this deliberate? Do they do this on purpose? Is it intentional? I don't know, I can't prove that, I can't look into the heads of policymakers and authorities. Um, so I've opted for the term strategic because I can show that this particular form of governance or non-governance actually shows interest as I just try to convey here. So as a final thought, I really wanna stress that this phenomenon, strategic institutional ambiguity is definitely not limited to matters of refugees and not limited to Lebanon or fragile states, if that's how we want to call them. Uh, I have a paper out in, in political geography that says that, that demonstrate that European refugee governance actually uses a lot of the same strategies through its hotspots and deals. It also uses institutional ambiguity as a disciplinary strategy vis-a-vis -vis refugee communities. Um, so on that note, on that disclaimer, I think I've talked already way longer than I then I should, and I'm really looking forward to, to open up the conversation with uh, well, everyone here. Thanks for bearing with me. Well, it was a pleasure. So thank you so much for, for summarizing concisely your key argument and, and a lot of the, the practice that you describe resonate a lot with the research that's being carried out uh, at our department. And I'm very glad that we have uh, two experts uh, with us today who will share their thoughts about your, your book. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Claudia, for her comments. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. I hope you can hear me okay. Okay, yes. excellent. Um, and I, I want to... I think we just lost you somehow, Claudia. It might, it might be the microphone. Yeah. Is this better now? That's better. Yeah, I think my headphones might be playing. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to, to repeat this because I think it's important <laughs> uh, that it has been a pleasure to read and reread Nora's book. Um, 
both uh, in when it was published, um, as I I also endorsed um, the book, but also along since it's been published um, along the COVID pandemic um, in workshops, all of them online so far. Um, and also I've engaged with uh, Nora's book in my own work. And what I want to, to do today is actually offer a series of questions for discussion um, rather than you know, kind of lengthy reflections, although they will be mixed with some reflections um, on the theoretical, methodological and political aspects of the book. I have read the book as an interdisciplinary dialogue with ignorant studies. And for some of you who are wondering, indeed, um, you, you might have seen some of the quotes uh, or some of the references on Nora's slides. Um, the book is also part of a relatively recent new series on research in international in ignorance studies with uh, Routledge. So you might want to have a look at the series as well. So theoretically, uh, the book shifts from the production of knowledge to the production and productivity of ignorance and not knowing by state and non-state actors. So for much of the research, both on um, refugee governance, but also more generally on state and non-state actors, the state is seen as supposedly knowing. The state makes populations legible so that they become governable. The state fixes and holds still. And we can think here, for instance, of the role that statistical knowledge has played in the government of populations, of demographic knowledge, of psychological knowledge that draws the lines between who counts as normal and who counts as abnormal. And more recently, um, for instance, what I'm thinking about is algorithmic knowledge that again proposes to recast how individuals and populations are being governed. And to bring uh, international relations, my own discipline to the table, research on security and insecurity in particular has unpacked heterogeneous modes of governing unknowns and taming uncertainty, whether through risk, resilience, preemption, or imagination. So non-knowledge or ignorance here becomes an imperative for the production of more knowledge. Um, but what we see in Nora's book is actually turning this the other way around. So rather than ignorance leading to more knowledge, it's in a, sense, in a sense the opposite. We have the production of different um, modes of not knowing of ignorance. Um, so despite official discourses of, for instance, producing data, producing statistics, producing knowledge about vulnerability, for instance, or migration flows and so on, migration management, um, discourses and practices generate ignorance. Right? So it is this productive generative aspect um, of ignorance that is key here. So Nora concludes the empirical investigation in the final chapter of the book by speaking about the politics of uncertainty as I quote, maintaining, feigning and imposing ignorance. And my first theoretical question is in fact about the relation between the concepts that play out um, both in the empirical analysis, but also theoretically closing the book between um, the concepts of ambiguity, uncertainty, and ignorance. Uh, so Nora, if I may offer another quote, again from the final chapter, you know that institutional ambiguity is not the same as ignorance, but it is a way to simultaneously profess and dictate ignorance. And you speak there about agnotological power. And I wanted to ask you to, um, unpack this distinction. And I was wondering whether you would extend it to uncertainty as well. Um, for instance, along the lines that uh, Jacqueline Best has suggested about differentiating between ambiguity and uncertainty. Now, this question of differentiation uh, takes me to a second point, which is more about the state and, and um, Lebanon and your analysis of its hybrid political order. And, I'm sure Craig will tell us much more, and many of you here probably know more um, about the state in Lebanon that, um, than I do, but bear with me. Um, so I really like how at many points through the book, institutional ambiguity is placed in relation to state illegibility more generally. Right. Um, 
And I was thinking here in particular about your, how you referenced the work in anthropology done by Vina Das and Deborah Poole, exactly on state eligibility, but also on work on um, in migration and uh, border studies, focusing on Europe, highlighting similar dynamics of eligibility, opacity, obfuscation, and uncertainty. And I think this is something you also pointed towards um, in your introduction today. So, so in my reading, there is an analysis of ignorance in the book as characteristic of state eligibility more broadly. But at the same time, again, as you're highlighting, the specificity of hybrid political order in Lebanon is an important part of the analysis. Um, and I was wondering here how you navigate these questions or whether there is a tension between the specificity of the analysis and this kind of more general um, analysis. So how do you navigate the tension between the specific politics of the state in Lebanon and this more general politics of state eligibility and bureaucratic or institutional ambiguity, right, of which you can see the traces um, in analysis of border and migration control more broadly. But I'm also thinking quite specifically about um, what I would say is an international aspect of the analysis. Okay, my lights just went off after, after my mic went off, my, um, my headphones went off, my, my lights, uh, the light went off, but I'm sure we are fine. So I'm thinking in particular about the context of the Geneva, um, of the Geneva Convention to which 1951 convention to which Lebanon is not a signatory. Um, and again, this is something that um, is really important in terms of your analysis of informal informality. And I was thinking of a recent article by uh, Ulrike Krause in the Journal of International Relations and Development, where she analyzes the colonial entanglements and exclusions of the Geneva Conventions, both who participated and had a say in the development of the convention, um, but also many of the colonial assumptions, the colonial clause, clause um, the kind of ignorance of the anti-colonial objections to the definition of the refugees, right, and their kind of effect on the present and again on the map of who is today a signatory and who is not a signatory. Um, to the Geneva Convention. And again, I think, how do we think in this context about the specificity of Lebanon in relation to this um, general, general dynamics, both historical dynamics of colonial legacies, but also dynamics of the, um, of the international. This question also leads me, I guess, to methodology. And you have addressed, probably you have answered my question, but I, <laughs> I will try to raise it again. Um, because in the book, you move from the analysis of effects to the analysis of actors, agency, and maybe strategy. You mentioned strategic rather than ignorance. And so one of my questions was exactly about the relation between what counts as strategic ignorance or strategy um, and intentional right, or intentional uh, ignorance and how you see this difference. And part of this question is, is methodological exactly because of the difficulties of analyzing intentions and what is intentional. Right? And that takes us also to strategy. How does one analyze um, what is then strategic? Um, so in my own work, I have focused more, mostly on effects exactly because of the difficulties, I think, um, of you know, tracing this willful, intentional kind of strategic types, type of production um, of ignorance. Um, so again, do you see this as different? This is my question, you see strategy, will, intention as different um, and how are they different from effects? And thirdly and finally, I'll, I'll turn to a political element or political aspect of the work partly because this is something that I am grappling with in my own work. So the, my question is about the analysis or rather the political implication of the analysis of institutional ambiguity for political action. So in the literature that has focused on, you know, making legible on the production of knowledge, be it 
often distorted knowledge, um, not knowing, being illegible, being opaque in some way, have been seen as tools of resistance and struggle. Yet what happens right, when the state and other actors become themselves, make themselves illegible, opaque, unknown, and in movement? And your reference to the, um, you know, your quote from um, your exchange with a Syrian refugee was really interesting in kind of preferring the knowledge um, in Syria to the kind of ambiguities in, in Lebanon. But I'm wondering what this effectively means in terms of political action, right? How are then to think about resistance? Does resistance need knowledge? And then what kind of knowledge? Um, would clarity be needed to fight the ambiguities um, of governance in Lebanon? Or could we still think conversely that Ignorance and ambiguity nonetheless can open spaces for agency and resistance, right? Um, and again, this might sound, <laughs> you mentioned counterintuitive, it could sound counterintuitive, um, but I was thinking earlier today that, for instance, clarity and transparency of oppression can be worse than ambiguity and uncertainty of oppression in, a, in the sense in which ambiguity can also open room for maneuver and mobilization. Um, so how do we think about, you know, again, these tensions, or how do you think about this, uh, these tensions? And do you effectively call then for more um, transparency, clarity, um, lack of ambiguity, um, in a sense, in these processes and in relation to the state in Lebanon? Thank you, one stop here. Thank you so much, Claudia. I can't wait to hear Nora's responses. <laughs> But before we go uh, to, to give the floor to Nora again, uh, we have Craig Larkin, uh, who is also giving um, some comments on, on Nora's book. Craig, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, I'll try to keep these very uh, brief. But firstly, I'd just like to thank Nora for this excellent contribution to literature on, on Lebanon and refugee studies. The book, I think, is fantastically researched. It's very evident. It's taken 10 years of research. It's theoretically and empirically rich, and it will definitely be going on my uh, class reading list on Lebanon. For a number of years, I've been grappling to try to understand and articulate Lebanese governance. And I think Nora's research provides a really helpful frame to not only look at refugee governance, but also wider Lebanese politics. Just last week, I was in Tripoli, Lebanon, Lebanon doing interviews with Islamist ex-prisoners. Um, also picked up COVID on the way on the way back home. So uh, I'm currently isolating in, in this room. I've seen far too much of this room. But Nora's book was such yeah, a joy to read alongside those interviews. It was like an intellectual refresher on Lebanon's hybrid political order. And I think in Lebanon, you know, what we're witnessing in the multiple crisis of Lebanon, where the refrain is when El Dawli or where is the, the state? Nora's book made me think perhaps the question is Shuel Dawli or what is the state? Indeed, the problem is perhaps not Lebanon state's absence, but the multiple shifting forms, actors, mediators that it governs through. And the state's hybridity and diversity makes it omnipresent, but nebulous, pervasive, yet unaccountable. And it indeed perpetuates strategic institutional ambiguity as a means of governing through mechanisms to discipline, exploit, and expel specific populations. Some may argue, in fact, Lebanon as a state is founded on institutional ambiguity. Its unwritten national pact was the basis for power sharing. And then post-civil war, we have the Taif Accord, which consolidates sectarian elite system, but it has a future aspirational dream of a secular demilitarized politics. But in reality, it's just amalgamated assemblages of power dependent on each other, but not accountable to the people. So I just wanted to pick up and highlight a few uh, key contributions and questions that you know perhaps Nora uh, could pick up on. And I think empirically, this is a really rich and interesting argument because it's quite easy and it's been done to reflect comparatively on the Syrian refugee crisis and the Palestinian refugee crisis in Lebanon. 
it's easy to argue that Lebanon has been guided by its historic mistakes and the sort of bogeyman of its approach to Palestinians pre-civil uh, war, because in, indeed the fear was over status, camps and representation, the political mobilization of Palestinian refugees and the loss of sovereign control of the camps undoubtedly contributed to the Lebanese civil war. But what's interesting is that Nora highlights, we see similar and parallel Lebanese policies of informality, liminality and exceptionalism in both cases. So it's not the contradiction, but it's the actual continuation of this concerted policy towards refugee governance. And I think that is really quite powerful and an original contribution in looking at the, the non-status of Palestinian gatherings and similarly Syrian settlements. Also the non-status of their mediators, whether that's a Syrian shawish or a mediator who, who deals with authorities in the camp or the Palestinian popular committees, which can also be exploited and co-opted. There's also a very important comparison in the flawed censuses that have taken place. The fact that the UNHCR were told to stop counting Syrian refugees and the most recent Palestinian census is also very flawed and open uh, for manipulation. So there's this continuation of Lebanese refugee policy, which I think allows us to speak to both of the cases, but to see uh, a similarity of Lebanese approach. Second uh, point and concept, which I find quite interesting, and Nora didn't mention it in the lecture, was the idea of potenza or this notion of a discretionary power. And I think that is a very powerful way of not only understanding the Lebanese approach to governance of Syrian refugees, but in fact, to their broader governance uh, approach. So Potenza is the creation of a situation in which everything is simultaneously prohibited and allowed, renounced, yet encouraged, deniable and enforceable. So it's a discretionary power to act or not act. So within Lebanon, this becomes everything is possible, um, but whether everything is permissible is another question. So Potenza denotes a situation where the institutional environment is ambiguous and ambiguous enough to open up multiple interpretations. The governance implementation is almost entirely dependent on the discretionary power of the authority at hand which can opt towards repression, abandonment, compassion, seemingly at will. I think this is a really important frame for understanding how both Syrians and Palestinians have been subject to the whim of general security, mayors, intelligence services, political parties, landlords. Even in, in my own work on, on Syrian urban refugees, very few of them ever had written contracts and I think that's the interesting way things trickle down from institutional um, ambiguity to everyday ambiguity in a contract. There is no contract because they remain vague and ambiguous and it, it allows the landlord to be able to adapt to the situation. There, there's one great quote in the book and, it, and I think it confirmed one Lebanese interlocker said, I don't think we have a system. We just need to know everyone. Uh, and this is this is very true that the system does not seem uh, so formulated, but personal wasta re remains a key feature. Thirdly, I think there's a great potential for the wider application of this theory to Lebanese politics. As Nora outlines, the manner in which uh, the Lebanese state consolidate power is similar over all Lebanese inhabitants, you know, whether it's veto power, the politics of evasion, we can see even with the most recent port explosion and attempts to bring uh, accountability to MPs and, and judges also being uh, involved in that. To the vagueness of numbers and census, the utility of ignorance and unknowing and mediated hybrid governance. In my own research just this week, dealing with Lebanese justice and, and prison system, what you find is that prisoners are arrested and often left for years without trials. They remain in a limbo uh, of the discretion of judges, politicians, and intelligence agencies. So in fact, 
very much a replication of the features of institutional ambiguity. And although Nora highlights that this could be a similar approach to Syrian refugee governance, if we look to, to Jordan and Turkey and perhaps even uh, within Europe, I believe it's this Lebanese system of power which helped shape the refugee policy. So institutional ambiguity and the politics of uncertainty are effects and manifestations of the hybrid political Lebanese order. So the fact that that is shaped from a top-down institutional political system, a hybrid system, allows for ambiguity to filter through many levels of, of Lebanese society. So just finally, uh, to sum up, uh, the book brought me back to, to a very simple question. Could Lebanon actually have handled the influx of Syrian refugees differently or more successfully? Was it the only viable coping mechanism of a mediated state? Resistance also does remain a part of the politics of uncertainty. And despite attempts to control, exploit and marginalize, Syrian refugees, I believe, will remain and become informally integrated into the Lebanese system. Because the politics of uncertainty, uncertainty does provide space for agency. It provides spaces to exploit the system, to live within the margins and the gray spaces. And I think so much of uh, of Lebanese life, sadly, at the minute, is within those margins and grey spaces. So the Palestinian experience is also testament to that. So I think a question is, what would the longer term impact be for Syrian refugee population and what impact would it have on the Lebanese future? So I'll, I'll just end it there and hand over to, to Nora. Yeah, exactly. What Craig said. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for, for, for these sort of reflections and invitations for, uh, for further um, comment and thinking. I'm, I'm just thinking of how to best pick this up while also leaving some time uh, maybe for further discussion. But let, let's just take things in turn because I'm, uh, I'm really inspired by all these comments. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks Claudia for addressing on these different levels sort of the, the potential implications of, of thinking this through further and, and with your first point sort of trying to unpack a bit more theoretically the difference between ambiguity and uncertainty um yeah for me i've also really been grappling with this and also since publishing the book may have uh, already uh, um, um, some some different conceptualizations and mind maps uh, coming out there but but the way of trying to do this in the book is see really ambiguity as as sort of um uh, um and 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 a characteristic of 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 the of of governance behavior so a characteristic of of governance and uncertainty much more to denote sort of the outcome of that the lived experience of refugees and i think this is also where specifically in the field of refugee studies um this work has been really exciting for me because not just me, but like a whole a host of scholars is now sort of has first started to look towards ignorance studies, I think, to to find tools to go beyond sort of noting this uncertainty and insecurity and exhaustion as a lived experience of refugees and and try to link that to to the governmentalities behind that. And I think, um, yeah, that that's how I've also tried to try to relate these these things. Um, and and with with your with your uh, yeah your second point, which is really I think also relates to a lot what what, what Craig was bringing in is sort of what is specific to Lebanon's hybrid political order and what is more sort of uh, generically applicable. Um, I my my tr my attempt to resolve this was to sort of uh, post facto differ, uh, uh, sell this as an extreme case study. But I do, I do think there's some merit in that, in the sense that, yeah, Lebanon is is very extreme in 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 the way sort of this ambiguity has historically been institutionalized. But I think a lot of the logics and convenience, um, yeah, is is actually universal, both as sort of a contingency just on complexity, right, uh, uh, and trying to have compromises, and that the the universal convenience of you know avoiding uh, uh, accountability and liability and the flexibility in the maneuvering space that that this all 
allows for, and here Lindsay McGuey's work on, on sort of unknowing uh, um, uh, has been really inspiring to me. Um, but, but yeah, your other point that you brought up here was really, really also very important to me. Um, specifically, you, you address the, the, the Geneva Convention and sort of the, yeah, the, the colonial um, um, context of this and, 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 and um, repercussions of, of that. But I think that addresses a, a broader point that, that um, has been very sort of uncomfortable for me in writing this, this book, where, where I do think the focus on Lebanon has been beneficial and important. And, and if the conclusion is that Lebanon is doing a lot of things in problematic ways when it comes to governing refugees, I, I stand by that. But it also, of course, obscures a lot, which is the geopolitics of all this, uh, the ways in which um, this particular mode of governing is not just a function of Lebanon's political system, but also the, 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 universe, the, the externalization of the hosting of refugees, the, the containment policies of, of Europe, and these, well, I bring in a few disclaimers, but these remain a bit out of the out of the picture, inevitably, in 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 focusing on this this one country. So this is, I think, for me, an important um, uh, uh, well, an important tool to reflect on that. Where I do think it's really important to also see these um, this non governments, this this strategic inaction. In a domestic setting, if it's directed vis-a-vis -vis refugees, then it's very disciplinary. But if you would see this in more of a geopolitical arena, I would, I would also, and, and I know that many Lebanese observers would see this also as, as a form of resistance, as a form of contention against this external uh, uh, externalization of refugee policies, but broader against sort of neo-colonial or um, uh, 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 dynamics of, of, of transnational governance. Um, I'm, I'm going on way too much, but one thing on this Geneva Convention that I thought was very interesting is that it's that, exactly what you said and, and, and what Ulrike also argued, but one of the articles by um, Maya Yanmir also makes a really important point here is that when not when asked why not sign this refugee convention, right? Um, often here, again, Lebanese authorities sort of revert to um, playing the ignorance card. They say, well, that brings all kinds of obligations that are unclear to us, where she shows in her article, well, these obligations are actually very clear and Lebanese authorities know very well what that does and does not entail. But it's their excuse for not signing it as well, you know, then you open Pandora's box. Whereas in closed door meetings, um, it's very obvious that Lebanese officials are very well informed and know exactly what it would entail and wouldn't entail. So there's, there's again this unknowing and ignorance um, dimension. Um, the methods, yes, well, oof, the methods of, of studying uh, uh, strategic ambiguity are really, yeah, I haven't figured them out even after writing a book on them. Um, but yeah, one of my solutions here was to, to focus on strategy. And I think the work of um, Lisa Wedin has been really inspirational where sort of her, uh, um, take, her, her take on the, 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 the um, complexities of domination through ambiguity, where she's well, you can't look into people's heads. So intentions are, are, are too hard, um, uh, are, are impossible to, to prove. You can, you can trace the interest. So I've tried to do that. Also, maybe looking back uh, very naively, I, I, just, I just didn't want to settle for, for not going into sort of the politics that I that I thought I saw behind that, but it's it's still a, a challenge. The interesting thing is that I have also sometimes very direct attributions, right, where, where you speak to consultants or advisors to ministries or even previous ministers um, who would just literally say, well, yeah, of, of course we didn't want to register. We could have done it, but we didn't for this reason. So these very few um, very open reflections have also given me sort of the encouragement to to, to keep seeing this as also, not only, but also strategically. Um, yeah, and your last point, which also links to one of Craig's uh, points, I'm trying to combine things, is, is really important. Yeah, I do definitely think that this, this sort of, the politics of uncertainties and, 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 and institutional ambiguity leave a lot of room for contention, for creative reappropriation, for gray spaces that, you know, um, I won't, I don't often know if I would call it resistance, but at least for survival, for coping in ways that maybe straight out repression or very 
clear cut, unambiguous um, uh, disciplinary strategies don't leave. So yeah, I'm, I'm always very grateful. I'm not uh, a policymaker. Uh, I don't have to give recommendations, but I, I wouldn't, I I've never meant my book to be sort of as a call for formalization and clarification, because first of all, I don't think it's possible, but also if it's, if I, I would not say it's necessarily desirable. And I think this is also the, the sentiment that many uh, refugees and refugee representatives that I spoke with um, shared that they said, well, it's very important to recognize sort of the detrimental effects of all this informality, but it's it's simultaneously important to say that that if the Lebanese state would formalize things, that would probably not improve matters. So yeah, I've tried to go move away a bit from the sort of the romanticization of informality um, and, and sort of refugee agency within that. Uh, I think that's problematic, but definitely didn't want to go to the entire other side of the spectrum. And, and for, for Craig Scum, I, I think I addressed a couple of things already. Um, I'm definitely gonna take up the, uh, the move from Wayne al Daoula to Shu al Daoula. Uh, that's a really great one. Um, and I think your reflections also make me further think on, on yeah, one of the central challenges in doing this research is that you always, always wonder if it's just me as a researcher that doesn't get it. I mean, I don't understand all of what was going on, but there was always the existential question, is that just me? Or, and, and do actually Lebanese and, and, and Palestinians and Syrians very well understand how this works? Or indeed, is this a more sort of broader thing that goes beyond my ignorance into sort of a governmentality of ignorance? Um, and I think there's degrees. I think that many Lebanese would say, well, um, we, 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 understand how this works, even if it's informal and, 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 and ambiguous. Um, but I've, and I've also, um, yeah, I'm also thinking about how to take this further beyond to the refugee populations, because yeah, many Lebanese friends have, have also sort of told me, well, this is the life that, that we live as well. It's not, it's not refugees um, per se. Um, and here, I think, the, the sort of the recent developments in Lebanon, the protests, sort of the 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 um, um, and also the the uh, the crackdowns uh, uh, against that, but also the sort of the the afterplay of the Beirut explosions are really fascinating. As to read again from this pr perspective of ignorance studies, it was also, for instance, in the Human Rights Watch reports on the Beirut explosions and the centrality of the notion of criminal neglect. Um, in that, for me, that really resonated again with sort of the, 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 uh, the disciplinary effects of, of inaction, of not governing and, and what that can do. Um, yeah, and I think your, your last point, I hope I sort of already addressed that a little bit. Um, you know, that indeed, I do believe that there's a lot of room for contention and, and well, I don't know, resistance, but at least contention and survival within this sort of gray space. And if Lebanon could have handled it differently, well, I, I like to think so, but then it would have been, it should have been a different Lebanon, right? A different Lebanon could have handled the refugee crisis very differently. Yeah. I'll uh, stop talking. Thanks so much for all this food for thought. Thank you, Nora. We do have an, a few um, questions and comments in the chat, and I'm trying to summarize them, uh, or like to, to relate them a little bit. And I think that, that, that the, the theme of ambiguity is quite interesting um, here again to make sense of it. So one, there is the, the, the more empirical methodological question is like how to distinguish between um, an actual strategic element within not knowing um, or not applying knowledge or, or is it really a lack of, of, of implementing certain rules that might be in, in the background. Um, and and then a related um, question uh, from from Hassam uh, is, is is like you, you mentioned at some point it's a bit provocative to assume strategic uh, uh, ambiguity. Um, why is that? Why is it provocative? For whom is it? Is it provocative to to assume that there could be something else going on than a weak state failing uh, to provide order? Or is is that provocative? Uh, and then maybe to 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 extend the provocation um, um, is, is is an strategic ambiguity also in the way on the Western uh, like discourse about refugees. I, I remember in the German context when uh, this this self congratulatory 
uh, stand of like we've accepted so many Syrian refugees when the the, the real proportions of, of, of are of course totally different and the majority of uh, of, of, of refugees um, end up in the region or are internally displaced. So is there also a, an element of ambiguity, ambiguity here in terms of the, the broader public discourse about refugee politics? Yeah, thanks. Um, great. I think, yeah, with, with, yeah, this is exactly the challenge, right? Uh, uh, with, with what you're first saying, that when is it strategic? When is it a lack of implementing? And, 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 the, 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 the trick is, of course, like, how do you know? Because the whole point is that even when it is strategic, it looks like a contingency or capacity or lack of implementation. That is always the default answer of any authority, not just in Lebanon, that we would say, well, you know, we, we would have wanted to do that, but we couldn't because of this. So, yeah, um, I think for me, what was really helpful in, in trying to think that through um, was the notion of non-performativity. Uh, by Sarah Ahmad uh, in a very different context she, she's used that but I think for me um, I've, I've, I've also found that really insightful so the idea that that particular um, policies or decisions are sort of made not with the aim to actually be implemented or to actually have an effect but just sort of to to maintain the status quo or to get critics uh, to assuage critics and I've and through that lens, I've, I've, I've sort of interpreted many policies. And there's a risk, right? Because there's also this tunnel vision that once you see strategic ambiguity, everything is strategic ambiguity. And any sort of well-intentioned um, uh, initiative to actually formalize something or regulate something is then, um, again, sort of repackaged from that perspective. Um, but, I, but I do think that that's, in many cases, what is going on. And I give some, some concrete examples in, in, in the book where even when decisions are being made, if you trace them back and if you have sort of a critical lens on them, it's very clear that 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 they were never that that there wasn't an attention. This is sometimes actually explicitly admitted by the people who were involved in making them. There was never an intention to actually implement them to actually do that. So yeah, that's been for me an important concept to, to think that through. And, but I think that also gets to that second point of why is it provocative to assume um, well, because the default answer is always, well, we would have done it if we could, right? We just don't have the capacity. And to many extent, that's a fair uh, point to make, right? Uh, because remember, again, in the context of this European externalization and the completely disproportionate numbers that, of refugees that Lebanon has been forced to, to welcome, um, that is a really relevant point. And I don't want to sort of skip that. But that makes it provocative to say, well, it's not only that, it's not only capacity, it's also political will, it's also convenient to state and unstated interest to not deal with this in sort of um, more formal ways. And, and here, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, because I think I've never formulated it in this way, but it's absolutely spot on. Here is also where the EU Western ignorance comes in, right? Because its approach towards the containment of refugees in the Middle East um, is completely dependent on the idea that this is a capacity problem. That is, as long as we sort of train and fund uh, uh, enough uh, and build states and institutions and resilience, then it'll work out. And, and there's no room in that logic for sort of a lack of political will, which is something, of course, that any diplomat and European official in Lebanon that I've spoken with and many and probably all the others as well, are very well aware of. They know very well sort of these political dynamics. They know much more about it than I do, but they can't admit that. So they also have to be, have to be ignorant on the political unwill to address this because their entire policy depends on this being a pure capacity issue. So I think there's, there's the provocation. And um, it, it also in humanitarian studies, there's been really interesting conceptualizations of sort of the ignorancy, uh, that, that's a term that uh, I've read about, the ignorancy of the international community, sort of the willful ignorance towards the politics of these things because it doesn't fit um, with, with our policies. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Nora. Thank you everyone for your contributions. We have uh, actually extended, uh, or maybe let's put, put it differently.
um, we, we have used uh, the ambiguity of, 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 of the liminal ambiguity of this meeting um, to the point that we could have extended it by, by, by 15 minutes by now. Um, I think it was fantastic, insightful um, conversation. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today um, for the book launch. Um, thank you to Claudia and to Craig for your comments. I think it was really, really interesting to see uh, like the different perspectives and how um, like the, the conversation I think demonstrates that uh, uh, your argument is really um, a sparking conversations and I um, can't wait to uh, follow Craig's lead and assign your book to uh, um, some of our core modules. I think that will be um, fantastic reading. Thank you everyone uh, for attending, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you also to Leonie Anson de Vries uh, from the Migration Studies uh, Network at King's and uh, our communications team, um, Alessi Allen and, and uh, Freddy. Um, so uh, with that, um, Thank you so much, everyone. And, yes. Um, Thanks so much for having me and for these wonderfully inspiring uh, 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 discussions. And and yeah, if anyone wants to discuss things further or, or has any questions, ideas, uh, just be in touch. I, I would love that. And uh, okay. thanks. Fantastic. The recording will be made available via our uh, social media channels. Thank you Thanks so everyone. much. All right. It's really been a pleasure to hear you discuss the book again and engage with the questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me sort of reread and rethink my own book. That's uh, that's amazing. I really appreciate it.